Good evening. My name is David Oliver. I'm the Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Iowa State University, and I welcome you here this evening for a very exciting university lecture. Uh, we have two fascinating speakers who will share their insights on the parallels between animal and human health. Tonight's lecture is the second lecture of the endowed One Health Lecture Series, made possible through the generosity of the Mayer family in honor of Dr. Roger Mayer, ISU alum, CEO of the One Health Commission. This, the lecture is co-sponsored by the College of Veterinary Medicine and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the government of the student body. Collaboration amongst healthcare professionals is central to the One Health concept. Our speakers have been invited to Iowa State because we as a university embrace this One Health concept. Several colleges are actively involved in promoting One Health and with the arrival of the One Health Commission to our campus, we have a partner and a global voice in making the concept a reality. I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speakers who will be available after the lectures back in the back of this room for a reception and a book signing. Our speakers are the co-authors of the book, just in case you were wondering what that was on the screen, <laughs> Subiquity. Okay. It's based on the simple idea that animals and humans get the same diseases. It draws upon the latest in medical and veterinary science, as well as on basic evolutionary and molecular biology theory. It's the author's journey as they, as they learn how interconnected all species are. Author and cardiologist Barbara Naderson Horowitz has treated human patients at the UCLA Medical Center for more than 20 years. She's a cardiac consultant for the Los Angeles Zoo and a member of the zoo's medical advisory board, as well as director of imaging at the UCLA Cardiac Arrhythmia Center. Dr. Naderson Horowitz earned her bachelor's and master's degree from Harvard University, and she received her medical degree from the University of California at San Francisco. Catherine Bowers has written and edited fiction and nonfiction books and articles. She's taught writing at UCLA. She began her career in journalism as a staff writer for Atlantic Monthly and for CNN International in London. Catherine later served as an assistant press attache at the US Embassy in Moscow where she received the State Department's Meritorious Honor Award for her service. Dr. Bowers holds a bachelor's degree from Stanford. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nattersmith Horowitz and, Doc and Ms. Bowers to Iowa State University. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oliver, for that wonderful introduction and for hosting us so warmly and graciously here at Iowa State University. Thank you also to Dean Lisa Nolan and to Dr. Roger Marr for your path-breaking work at the intersection of animal and human medicine, and also for so enthusiastically supporting our work and our ideas, starting back last summer when we met you in San Diego and even before. It's really been exciting to hear uh, all of the interdisciplinary collaborations you have going on here at Iowa State, uh, from the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom. Uh, thank you also to Tracy Rafe and Lisa Sebring for helping keep track of the details to bring us here, um, and to Dr. Marr's family who are sitting here in the front row today. Um, this is a special night for Barbara and me. Zubiquity was launched today in its paperback version, which means that it was the first day you could buy it in paperback uh, with the brand new redesigned cover, and you are some of the first people to be able to see this. Um, if you didn't see them outside, there's a beautiful stack of the paperbacks out there, and we're really pleased to be here at Iowa State for this milestone for our book and our ideas. And it's doubly a privilege to be speaking to you here at the second annual One Health Lecture that's been established in honor of Dr. Roger Marr. Dr. Marr is a towering figure in One Health, 
And from the earliest stages of our book, Barbara and I knew that he was going to be a central part of it. The reason he's so important to us is that One Health as we know it today, as it's become, as it's developed in 2013, simply does not exist without his visionary leadership and what he's brought to the idea of bringing these two related fields together. In fact, Dr. Marr's historic collaboration and friendship with a human physician uh, who was Dr. Ron Davis from the American Medical Association is a centerpiece of the first chapter of our, our book, which we called Dr. House Meet Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> Barbara and I chose that chapter title because we thought it perfectly illustrated this main point that animals and humans get the same diseases, yet the doctors who take care of them rarely collaborate with one another. Um, but when you think about it, um, why aren't these two sides collaborating? Intellectually, we know we are animals. Some of us might not want to admit it every day. Some of us might feel like it more than others. Um, but our health connects in countless ways with the other members of the species that we share this planet with. Um, I saw uh, actually a commercial on TV the other day that's kind of a funny example of this. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's a white duck in a hospital bed with its bill taped shut and its wing and traction and a bunch of doctors come in to examine their patient and they're human doctors. So the joke is that it's an a animal, a bird in a human hospital. And um, I saw that ad at first and I thought, that sure is a ubiquitous kind of ad. But, but it didn't really answer a question that I've had, which is, why does that matter? Why are we so interested in other animals? Uh, every day on TV, on the radio, in newspapers, we have stories about animals. We hear about blue jays and their complicated societies and their, their systems for figuring out who's a thief and who needs to be punished in their societies. We learn that elephants and dolphins grieve when they lose a member of their family. We learn how bumblebees can navigate toward their source of nectar by sensing the electrical fields that are within the, the flowers that the flowers are putting out. Uh, we hear that orangutans and chimpanzees and even gorillas have midlife crises. Um, and we've even um, started hearing about collective behavior among animals, that, that groups of living things, whether they're the cells inside our own bodies or the flocks, herds, and schools around us, communicate and move in much the same way that we do as organized groups of people. So clearly we are fascinated by animals and our worlds and how we interact with them. But again, the question is, is that all there is? Are, are these stories just fascinating or maybe they're just funny? Barbara and I think not. We think, and we've learned that many at Iowa State uh, agree, and we're certainly not alone in this, that the diseases that veterinarians treat, the animals they care for, are highly relevant to human disease and health. Our understanding of breast cancer, heart disease, anxiety disorders, the bread and butter of clinical human medicine can be transformed by the comparative knowledge that veterinarians possess. Moreover, the time is right now for comparative, interdisciplinary, collaborative approaches to all kinds of problems. If you look at universities, the world of business, even the arts and sciences, the idea of working across boundaries, across disciplines is starting to take center stage. Biologists are starting to collaborate with ethicists, gerontologists with interior designers, historians and anthropologists with environmental ecologists. So tonight, Barbara and I are going to tell you the story of Zubiquity how we came to put animal medicine and human medicine side by side, and why we think veterinarians will transform human medicine. It's a journey of collaboration and working across fields and sometimes crossing academic cultures. And it begins with my co-author, Barbara Natterson Horowitz, and an experience she had with an animal that changed her life. Thanks, Catherine. Well, I am a cardiologist. I take care of, you know, heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, people with high cholesterol. And about 10 years ago, I was happily practicing cardiology here at UCLA. And then something happened that transformed my life. Not only my professional life, I, I worked as a cardiologist and taught medical students, but also how I thought about myself and my family. And what happened was I was given an opportunity to become a member of the medical advisory board of the Los Angeles Zoo. So zoos around the country are staffed by board-certified veterinarians who are expert in 
the treatment of exotic animals. But from time to time, zoos do reach into the human medical community for assistance or collaboration, particularly around some subspecialty need. And because I was a cardiac imaging specialist and the zoo had some imaging needs, they asked if I would help. So I, I want to tell you about one of the earliest experiences I had going to the zoo. I was working at the hospital, you know, taking care of my human patients, teaching students, and I got a call from one of the veterinarians. There was uh, a, uh, a chimpanzee, and she had woken up with a facial droop. So one side of her face was, was uh, it was asymmetrical, her face was. And when that happens with a human patient, we are concerned about whether there has been a stroke. Uh, and they wanted me to come and do the diagnostic procedure on the chimpanzee that I would do on the human patient, an internal form of cardiac ultrasound. So I hopped in my car, and a couple of freeways later, I was standing here uh, at the beautiful Gottlieb Animal Health and Conservation Center, which is a state-of-the-art hospital uh, at the top of the hill uh, at Griffith Park at the Los Angeles Zoo. And I remember I walked in, and, and there was my patient. She was uh, sedated and intubated, like many of my human patients in whom I do this procedure. Uh, so it was very exciting, of course. I had never done this procedure on a non-human patient. I walked over. I took my probe. I gooped it up. I placed it in the back of my patient's throat. I slid it down to just the right part. I turned around. I looked at the screen. And this is what I saw over on the left. It was a four-chambered beating heart, two ventricles, two atria. And as I looked at it, I gasped at how similar it looked to the tens of thousands of human hearts that I'd seen over 20 years at UCLA. And when I say similar, when I looked at that heart, it was indistinguishable from the human hearts. And I was almost immediately surprised at my surprise. I mean, intellectually, I knew that we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees very recently. I mean, we are most closely related to the common chimpanzee. Something like five to seven million years ago, we had a common ancestor. And I think everybody here uh, probably was exposed to this, this moment in time when uh, there was this nature cover that featured the near 99% genetic similarity between humans and, chimp and chimpanzees. So I knew we were closely connected, and yet I had this, this surprise. But upon further reflection, it wasn't the shared anatomy. It was actually the shared pathology that was very startling. Because as you're looking at the echocardiogram, take a look at the one on the left, the chimpanzee. And I'm going to move my arrow right here. Can you see these bouncing balls, these collection of echoes? Right? So this is the right atrium right here. That's the left atrium. And inside the right atrium, there are blood clots that are bouncing and moving. And actually, the cardiac ultrasound on the left has an infiltrative process. Uh, the, it, when you look at it, you know this is a form of heart disease. It's a form of what we call cardiomyopathy. And it is a form of cardiomyopathy that this human patient that I had seen several months before I did the chimpanzee echo also had, again, with the blood clots in the right atrium. And so, as I was looking at this chimpanzee echo and realizing that this was probably what we call amyloid cardiomyopathy, a disease I had taken care of for two decades in humans and had never occurred to me that this was not uniquely human. It, it began thinking about the shared diseases of animals and humans. By the way, would it be helpful to dim the lights? I don't know whether people in the back can see the slides, the echoes. OK. OK, I'll keep going. So during this period of time, I was going to UCLA, taking care of patients, but occasionally I'd go to the zoo. I had an opportunity to rule out a torn aorta in a gorilla. I assessed a macaw for a heart murmur. I evaluated a sea lion for constrictive pericarditis. In this picture, I'm listening to the heart of a lion after a procedure uh, that was done with a collaborative team of physicians and veterinarians in which we drained the pericardial sac of this lion, that's the sac in which the heart is contained, of about 700 cc's of fluid. Well, 
I started getting very interested in these connections because I was continuing my regular job as a physician, but I was being exposed to these diagnoses at the hospital. I would be on rounds at the, with the veterinarians at the zoo, and I would hear them talking about breast cancer and congestive heart failure and diabetes and OCD and anxiety disorders. And I would come back to UCLA and share this with my colleagues, and pretty much no one had heard of animals having these problems, which is pretty remarkable. So Catherine and I, at that point, we had uh, the great good fortune of meeting one another, and we started thinking about this gulf. Why was there such a divide between human and animal medicine? And more importantly, what was the cost of this separation, and what might the opportunities be if we brought these fields closer together? I began lecturing at UCLA, at other local hospitals and schools about the connection between animal and human health. I talked about some of the issues that had already been identified through the One Health uh, movement. The fact that the majority of emerging infections that are affecting human populations come from the animal reservoir. That's one compelling reason for physicians and veterinarians to collaborate. I talked about the important role that animals play in the life cycle of diseases that have a heavy impact on human communities around the globe. And I talked about the issue of animals as sentinels of human disease, that animals around the world, terrestrial animals, uh, you know, oceanic animals can develop diseases which presage the disease in, in humans. And I would speak to medical students about the fact that we have shared fathers, that our fields claim the same fathers. Sir William Osler is identified by every medical student, certainly in, in the United States and Canada, as a, an important father of modern medicine. But until we began this project, I didn't know that Osler is claimed as a father of veterinary medicine as well. In fact, he was one of the founders of McGill School of Veterinary Medicine and, in fact, coined this term one medicine. And of course, one of Osler's teachers was Rudolf Virchow, who was considered the father of modern pathology and wrote the wonderful quote, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. And I talked to medical students, and I talked to interns and residents, and I talked to faculty members, all physicians, about these connections between animal and human health. And the audience was interested and respectful, and that was about it. But what I began realizing as I would look at these physicians is that 95% of them were not infectious disease specialists, nor did they consider public health concerns to be their responsibility. They were pediatricians and gastroenterologists and dermatologists and cardiologists and psychiatrists and family practitioners and OBGYNs. That is who 95% of physicians are. And so Catherine and I started thinking about ways of enhancing this connection, of making it more real for the rank and file physicians that we knew and we wanted to communicate with. And so we created a rubric. If I encountered any diagnosis in a human patient at UCLA, we asked, does it happen in animals? And we had a number of ways of answering that question. So we asked, this is just a sample, we asked, do animals get breast cancer, sudden cardiac death? What about Hodgkin's lymphoma, atrial fibrillation? Could an animal get a brain tumor? What about sexual dysfunction, arthritis, aortic dissection? What about a sexually transmitted disease? And of course, the answer to every one of these questions was yes. Now, I know that there are a lot of veterinarians in the audience tonight, and there are veterinary students, and I have to tell you that when we've given this lecture to groups of veterinarians and vet students, and this slide goes up, what we see is exactly what I just saw, this. Yeah, of course. Actually, that's charitable. Occasionally, we've gotten a duh. <laughs> but I will tell you that I've given this same lecture to many groups of physicians and medical students, many academic physicians at some of the most important academic teaching hospitals in the country. And when this slide goes up 
and the yeses float up, the reaction is quite different. There's noise in the audience, laughter, talking. This is news to most physicians. And in our experience, almost all physicians, of course there are exceptions. There are physicians who have unique animal knowledge. We found that physicians, for example, who were raised on farms also know this. And there are physicians who are very familiar with veterinary medicine. But for the most part, this is news. Well, it is unfortunate that physicians are as ignorant as we are because there are profound benefits to our profession from having comparative knowledge. There are scientific benefits and there are professional benefits. The scientific benefits include the advantage of this comparative perspective. So for the veterinarians who are here, for the veterinary students, you guys are taught in a comparative way from the first week of vet school. Right? When you learn about cardiology, you learn, well, a mammal has four-chambered heart, and a reptile has a three-chambered heart, and a fish has a two-chambered heart, and here's how it works in these different species. And you look for differences, and you learn about the disease processes in this comparative way. It is quite the opposite when you're trained to become a physician. You exclusively learn about homo sapiens. Now, it wasn't always that way. Uh, my father is a physician, and he tells me that when he went to medical school, he had a course in comparative anatomy and comparative pathophysiology. But my dad is turning 90 this year. So sometime between when he graduated from medical school and when I graduated from medical school, the comparative courses were dropped from the curriculum. And there has been a cost to this. So the benefits include the comparative approach, which I think physicians could benefit from. Thinking comparatively is also hypothesis generating and potentially perception altering and destigmatizing. And I'll talk about that a little later when we talk about mental illnesses in animals and what that might mean to a human patient struggling with a comparable disorder. There are also professional benefits to this comparative approach and collaboration. This encourages physicians to look beyond traditional sources of knowledge to create interprofessional opportunities, and most importantly, interdisciplinary research. Well, let me give you some examples of why this is not only important, it actually enlivens how medical students can learn about the diseases they're going to be taken care of. So I'm a cardiologist, and there are a number of very scary conditions that um, you know, I need to know about, and one of them is something called aortic dissection. So the aorta is the largest artery in the body, right? The heart is here, the aorta comes off, and all of the arteries uh, that are going to feed blood and oxygen to the rest of the body come off of this large freeway, this large pipeline. And once in a while, it can tear. It's made of three layers, and the layers can actually come apart. It's called an aortic dissection, and it takes the lives of thousands of Americans every year. It took the life of the comedian Lucille Ball. I'm just going to give some a few famous people. It actually took the life of Albert Einstein. But what I didn't know until we began this project was it is also a leading cause of death among adult male gorillas in captivity. So when I am now teaching cardiovascular physiology to medical students, and I talk about aortic dissection, I ask a question. I say, aortic dissection occurs not only in humans, it occurs in, for example, gorillas. And I say to the students, what is the leading cause of aortic dissection? And someone will raise their hand and say, oh, it's atherosclerosis, so the buildup of cholesterol plaque in the arteries. And I say, well, wait a minute. What if I told you that gorillas don't typically get atherosclerosis? Why does a gorilla dissect? And they have to think about other causes. And they say, well, maybe there's a connective tissue problem. And then we begin discussing those potential, that cause. And we talk about the potential for hypertension in a non-human animal and compliance issues on medication regimens. And it amplifies, it expands the conversation and the way they think about the human animal who will be their patient. When we talk about cancer now, when I, try, when I talk to students about cancer, I try to think of it in a, in a comparative way. You know, there are cancers that um, I think many people assume are uniquely human. Um, recently and tragically, uh, Steve Jobs lost his life to a form of pancreatic cancer that's fairly rare in humans. It's a, it's a neuroendocrine, it's, a, it's a, a specific kind of pancreatic tumor. 
But it turns out, while it's rare in humans, it's common in ferrets and certain breeds of dogs. And again, this comparative perspective is not only hypothesis generating, it alters, I think, how students and potentially patients think about the diseases that impact them. When I was about 12 years old, I remember learning about another 12-year-old. Uh, his name was Ted Kennedy, Jr., and I, my parents told me about him. And I learned about him because uh, he had had cancer. I didn't know very much about cancer when I was a kid, but he actually... was unexpected. He had uh, a cancer called osteosarcoma. And osteosarcoma is a bone cancer that affects teenagers when they're having their growth spurts. It typically is seen in taller teenagers. But it turns out, and actually uh, he ended up having an amputation, uh, to, which was curative. He's still alive and I understand embarking on a political career himself. But it turns out osteosarcoma is also an important disease and, and sadly a killer of many large breed dogs, of, of golden retrievers and Bernese mountain dogs and St. Bernard's and other breeds. And so there are these important comparative elements and, and research is now uh, ongoing, which is bringing together what is known on the human side and the animal side to benefit in a bi-directional way both human and animal patients. Well, breast cancer was a topic that um, we felt was very important to cover because when you work in a human hospital, there is so much breast cancer and it impacts every department in the hospital. I mean, as a cardiologist, I look at cardiac ultrasounds all day long of women who are undergoing chemotherapy with drugs that can be very toxic to the heart muscle. And Catherine and I learned comparatively that breast cancer has been seen in practically every mammal in whom it has been looked for. So it has been seen in animals from kangaroos and camels to even whales. But we learned, and this has, I think, tremendous uh, potential importance for the human side, that there are certain mammals that are predisposed to breast cancer and others that seem to be relatively protected. We learned, for example, that jaguars originating in Venezuela have a high incidence of both breast and ovarian carcinoma. By the way, big cats in general, tigers and lions and leopards have a high incidence of breast cancer. And um, also certain breeds of dogs do as well. Well, there is a mutation called the BRCA1 mutation. And it's a, it's an, a mutation on the end of a chromosome that's seen in human patients who are predisposed to breast cancer. Now, that mutation is seen in certain ethnic groups. Uh, it's seen, for example, it's overrepresented among Ashkenazi Jewish women. And I am an Ashkenazi Jewish woman, and I had actually been recently screened for this BRCA1 mutation when Catherine and I were beginning to talk about this issue of comparative breast cancer. And so I have to say it was stunning to me to learn that jaguars, uh, some of these jaguars, are potentially susceptible to breast cancer because of a BRCA1 mutation. And by the way, the same thing is true of groups of English Springer Spaniels who are also predisposed to breast and ovarian cancer. They have this BRCA1 mutation. Well, it was, it was startling and actually was, this, was the inspiration for what became the title of our uh, cancer chapter. So we decided to entitle the chapter Jews and Jaguars. And, um, and that actually ultimately was not the chapter title. We added to it, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Because uh, around that period, as we were learning everything we could about cancer in different species, we stumbled upon an article with a title that was really thrilling and startling. The title of this, this article was The Epidemiology of Dinosaur Cancer. Now, looking back years after we encountered that originally, it seems amazing to me that we were even surprised. I mean, dinosaur DNA would be susceptible to the same transcription problems that human DNA or dog DNA would. Of course, dinosaurs would have cancer. And it turns out there are uh, many uh, instances of both primary and metastatic uh, cancer seen in the bones of dinosaurs ranging from Gorgosaurus to Hadrosaurs to uh, a range of dinosaur species. So ultimately, we ended up calling this chapter Jews, Jaguars, 
and Jurassic cancer. But to get back to this issue of predisposition versus a relative lack of, of susceptibility, we learned, and we thought this was really interesting, that dairy cows and dairy goats, what we understand some veterinarians call the professional lactators, that they almost never get breast cancer. And of course, this tracks closely with the human epidemiology that associates breastfeeding with a relatively reduced risk of breast cancer um, among women. So that is fascinating, I think very hypothesis generating, and just that kernel of knowledge uh, I think creates an opportunity for a kind of collaborative conversation which could have real impact on an extremely important human disease. Well, we covered everything, and we decided we would look, uh, for one of, our, one of our chapters, we wanted to look at STDs because STDs impose a tremendous burden on human health. And uh, we have a, a bunch of statistics in the book about it, but it turns out, of course, that humans are not the only animals that practice unsafe sex. Actually, we don't think there are any animals that do practice safe sex. And many of them have multiple sexual partners, so of course they're pathing, passing pathogens, viruses, bacteria, back and forth. And so it is really not surprising that animals would have STDs, and yet when we talk about STDs with physicians, it is shocking to them. Well, we learned that there's actually an epidemic of chlamydia, of venereally transmitted chlamydia affecting the koalas of Australia. And actually, we talk about the potential for translational modeling of the transmission of STDs in human populations by looking at how wildlife biologists in Australia are studying it in the koala. And of course, this became the inspiration for the title chapter of our STD chapter. We called it The Koala and the Clap. <laughs> and we could not resist the alliteration. I have to say, for the, for the 19th century historical uh, purists in the audience, you probably are thinking, well, the clap refers to gonorrhea, and it's, an, it's a 19th century English reference to gonorrhea. So we took a little bit of dramatic license because it sounded so good, but it was chlamydia. Well, we even decided we would look at what has become one of the most important issues to affect human populations, and that is, of course, obesity. We learned, and it was not that surprising to us uh, to learn that dogs and cats are getting fatter, just like we are. Uh, it's been estimated that up to 60% of our domestic cats and dogs now are overweight to obese. Uh, actually, we learned about some veterinarians in the UK who have used liposuction to deal with lipomas that are threatening the skeletal health, uh, the spinal health of some dogs. And we even learned about a low-carb, high-protein diet that's given to obese felines. And of course, it's called, wait for it, the Katkins diet. <laughs> but more interesting even than companion animal obesity was the reality that there have been some feral populations that have been noted to be getting fatter. And that opens up this possibility that there could be environmental factors that are contributing to a species-spanning obesity epidemic. Now, what those factors are, I don't know. And whether, in fact, this will be borne out to be true, I don't know. But what I do know is if, the, if we as physicians are only looking at this issue in our own species, we will fail to make the connections that allow us to generate the hypotheses that are necessary to advance the field. So we had a lot of fun writing this chapter. We learned so much, uh, and we entitled this chapter, Fat Planet. Well, it might have ended with the physical problems. We, we have chapters on, of course, cancer and heart disease. We have um, chapters on you know, STDs. But actually, before I trained as a cardiologist, I had kind of a unique path. I finished medical school, and I, uh, I, I couldn't decide what I was going to do. I loved everything. And uh, my father was a psychiatrist, and uh, it was kind of in the family. So I thought, you know, I'll train in psychiatry. So I actually did a full residency in psychiatry. And so I always had this interest in, in mental illness, kind of, but I ended up deciding I didn't want to be a psychiatrist, so I went and I retrained in internal medicine and cardiology. But as Catherine and I began thinking about this comparative question, 
we became intrigued about the question of mental health and illness in animals. And we learned, and I, I didn't know this, of course, everybody thinks about Darwin and you know, the Voyage of the Beagle. That was his first book, and then The Origin of Species, and then he wrote The Descent of Man. But his fourth book was a book that was called On the Expression of Emotion in Man and the Animals. And in fact, there has been quite a lot of interest, particularly in recent years, about mental health and potentially mental illness in animals. And so we decided to ask the question, what about mental illness? So we created the same rubric that we had used for the physical problems for the psychiatric issues. And we asked, could an animal develop obsessive compulsive disorder? What about separation anxiety? Could an animal get an eating disorder? Could an animal exhibit suicidal behavior? What about self-injury, what psychiatrists call cutting? There are different kinds of self-injury, self-mutilation, but could an animal self-injure? Could an animal be bullied? Could an animal become intoxicated? And of course, the answer to every one of these questions turns out to be a yes. Now, I have to say that we were careful when we asked these questions because we didn't want to reach too far. You know, when I went to high school and I went to college, I remember being sternly warned about not anthropomorphizing. That was uh, intellectual scientific sin number one. To do that just meant you were uh, sentimental, you were projecting. If you saw something that seemed human in an animal, that was, you just were not being scientific. And I was an A student and I wasn't going to do any of that. So, we had a little bit of that you know, as we entered this, this project. I have to say five years later, Catherine and I really think that at this point, given what we now know about the shared genomics between animals and humans, about the important impact of the environment on epigenetics, that the real risk is not anthropomorphizing. The real risk is failing to see these important and deep connections that we share with animals. But in any event, when it came to questions like suicidality or self-injury, we were very, very careful about how we, how we defined things. Um, and we can talk about some of those later. I'll cover a few of them, and then you can ask questions if you have uh, interest. Well, let's start with the low-hanging fruit. Um, can I have a, ra a sh raise your hand if you have a dog or a cat? Okay. Now, raise your hand if you have now or ever have had a dog or a cat that you think has had either a behavioral problem, you might call it a psychiatric problem, you might say mental illness. Raise your hand. And if I expand the definition to include anxiety, have you had, raise your hand if you've ever had an animal with anxiety. Okay. How about an animal with what you think is a compulsive behavior? Okay. So um, then let's start with, uh, yes, we have, we have an honest group here. Let's start with uh, anxiety and separation anxiety. So uh, as many of the veterinarians here, I'm sure all know, that there are certain breeds of dogs that are particularly predisposed to anxiety. And there are various forms of anxiety disorders that occur in animals. Uh, this dog actually has separation anxiety. And separation anxiety in dogs, from a symptomatic perspective, is characterized by barking and panting, pacing and whining, and, and all kinds of destructive behavior. If you've ever had one, you know what that is. But it turns out separation anxiety in humans is very similar in a number of very interesting ways to separation anxiety in dogs. The developmental window in which it emerges, the patterns of crying and protest when the object of connection is gone, the decay in crying uh, and the timing and when, when, um, in both ed dogs and in humans. And there are multiple forms of separation anxiety that are described in dogs and uh, animal behaviorists talk about them. But there's one form particularly that seems very, very much um, a kind of natural animal model of separation anxiety in the one to three-year-old child. There are other very interesting common uh, disorders. I don't know if any of you ever were fans of the television show Monk, but I love this show. And Monk is this completely brilliant detective. He's kind of like a Columbo-style detective, but his fatal flaw is that he has obsessive-compulsive disorder. And OCD, of course, is a very important human diagnosis. It uh, continues to rise in the human population. There's better diagnosis. 
But it turns out there, is, um, there are multiple forms of compulsive behavior that are seen in animals. One of them is called canine compulsive disorder. And although I have canine OCD here, the veterinary behaviorists are quick to point out that you can't really call canine compulsive disorder obsessive compulsive disorder because the O of obsession requires thought and thought requires verbalization to the physician. So when a human patient has OCD, and let's say they're washing their hands over and over and over again, if you ask them why they're doing it, they will tell you they have an obsessional thought. If I don't wash my hands 64 times before I leave the bathroom, my mother will get hit by a car. There is a sort of uh, obsessional thought that underlies the, uh, the behavior. I'm not sure why this is happening. Sorry about that. This is a first, but okay. <laughs> okay. There we go, back to Monk. So canine compulsive disorder is, um, I think, a close, a natural animal model for human OCD. And one of the most interesting similarities, well, some of the most, OCD in humans is very genetic. Uh, there's, there are families, it runs in families, and there's some very good um, already, there's certain gene, candidate genes that are being looked at. We know that there are certain breeds of dogs, Dobermans, for example, and others that have a high incidence of canine compulsive disorder. And I think in, in a fascinating parallel, the most iconic human compulsive behaviors associated with OCD have to do with grooming, hand washing, hair brushing. And if you look at the compulsive behaviors of dogs with canine compulsive disorder, much of it also centers on grooming, licking, su a fabric sucking, um, plucking, grooming behaviors that become amplified. And I think that is a clue that really points to some shared mechanism. You know, there is a disorder we learned about that affects birds, and it is called feather plucking disorder. And parrots particularly, but other birds as well, when they are stressed, can respond by plucking out feathers. And sometimes they can denude their bodies. Well, it turns out there is a human disorder called trichotillomania. And trichotillomania is uh, on the OCD spectrum of behaviors. It can be very serious. It can obviously profoundly uh, impact a human being's life. And these people typically pluck out patches of hair. The eyelashes are the most common targets, but it can be any hair in the body. And this poor woman has plucked out half of the hair in her uh, scalp. And there are some very interesting parallels in what triggers feather plucking disorder in a bird and what triggers trichotillomania in a human patient. We have given this lecture now to groups of psychiatrists uh, at, at, at medical schools. And I have to say that these connections are so rich. And this is such low-hanging fruit. And it has been basically not explored at all. And so I'm really excited about watching collaborative projects happen in the near future, which link these disorders together. You know, self-injury is actually a very important problem in the human side. Um, I was, a, so I was a psychiatrist before I was a, an internal medicine doctor. And I remember um, I saw a woman once, and uh, I was talking to her about some other issues. And I saw that on the interior of her left forearm, she had these well-heeled kind of horizontal scars. And I recognized that pattern. Uh, she was a cutter, which is what psychiatrists call a cutter. And, you know, when Catherine and I asked that question, we said, well, could an animal self-injure? Would an animal ever self-mutilate? We thought that was crazy. I mean, I remember thinking, well, that is just, we have this wonderful scientific book that we're writing, and we're just going to blow it by asking a question that's so obviously the cutting, it's so disordered, it's got to be uniquely human. And of course, we were completely wrong. We now know that many, many animals, from birds to horses to octopus to uh, cats and dogs, self-injure, and they do it a lot. And they do it for reasons which are well known to veterinarians. 
Uh, this is a dog who has something called acrolic dermatitis. This dog has licked and licked and licked and licked until the skin was broken. And even when the skin was broken, he's continued to, uh, to, to denude the skin and break the skin. Here's where we think the translational opportunities are rich. If a young woman comes to me and she's cutting, what are we going to do? I'm going to sit with her and we're going to talk about her life. We're going to talk about her relationships. We're going to talk about her early childhood. We're going to try to connect. And while I may use drugs to help her get through this, we're going to use a lot of talk therapy, a lot of psychotherapy. Well, veterinarians obviously don't have talk therapy as an option. So what they do, the ones we've interviewed, is they look at the environment. And they ask, what is happening in the environment that is contributing or triggering the self-injury? And they've identified three factors that are very predictive of self-injury in certain animals. One of them is isolation. One of them is boredom. And the third is social stress. Well, if you superimpose that model to the human animal, might we begin treating self-injuring patients in a different way. I mean, we learned that because isolation can trigger self-injury, for example, in a horse, an isolated horse who's self-injuring is brought back to the herd. Horses are herd animals. They should be with other horses. And if there aren't other horses around, we understand that some veterinarians will take a little chicken and put it in the stall. Just the presence of another companion can decrease the self-injuring behavior. And we learned that since boredom is a risk factor for self-injury, they don't strap on the feed bag and let the animal consume the meal in five minutes. They create foraging difficulties. They create challenges, environmental enrichment to combat boredom. I think all of us can imagine how that model might shift how we think about a self-injuring teenager in their room alone, either physically alone or psychologically alone. Of course, the drugs that we use to take care of human beings with psychopathology are now very similar to the drugs that are used in animal patients. Um, it was fun the first time we learned that one of the most commonly pre uh, prescribed veterinary psychopharmaceuticals is a drug called Reconcile. So Reconcile is the brand name for fluoxetine. And fluoxetine, when it's given to human beings, is called Prozac. And one of the, the most uh, enjoyable fun facts is that the manufacturers of Reconcile take the fluoxetine and they infuse it with a beefy scent and a beefy taste to make it more palatable. But it's Prozac. And we know that lots and lots of animals are on Prozac. Just as a little um, aside, we've talked to a number of, we've talked to many, many physicians and veterinarians over the years, but we've learned that psychiatrists particularly, if you ask them about their animals who have mental illnesses, a lot of them have prescribed uh, this class of medication for their pets. They've just given them the, the, well, my dog, you know, my dog has OCD. I gave him Prozac or, so it's very, very uh, kind of interesting. Let me hit a few other disorders and, and then wrap things up. Catherine and I asked, could an animal get an eating disorder? Well, if your definition of an eating disorder is an adolescent girl standing in front of the mirror saying, I look fat, then no, animals don't get that kind of eating disorder. They're not going to have body dysmorphic disorder. But if you ask a different question, if you ask a doctor, a veterinarian or physician, a simple question, can the environment affect your e eating? Does the environment affect eating? Can stress affect eating? Everyone would say, well, of course. And so if you think about an eating disorder, as a perturbation in normal eating behavior that is triggered by an environmental change, then you begin to think, well, maybe, yes, this would be conserved across species. We learned about something called the thin sow syndrome. And here we are in the capital of probably of pig knowledge, um, in, maybe in the world. We, I just learned that uh, pigs outnumber humans in Iowa at a ratio of five to one. So, we want to learn, actually we are here um, in part to learn as much as we can, but there are some uh, female pigs, it can actually happen in males as well, when they are going, undergoing social stress, particularly when they're transitioning into the adult herd, and that hierarchy 
uh, can be treacherous and socially difficult, some of the sows will respond to the stress by decreasing how much they eat. In some cases, they stop eating altogether. They will stop going into heat. And, and some of them actually have this restless behavior where they want to move a lot. A woman with severe anorexia nervosa will stop having her menstrual periods. Some of them become in preoccupied with moving. They want to over-exercise. There's this weird uh, kind of counterintuitive behavior that you see. And both affected uh, sows and affected women, the hair becomes very coarse and thin. We think this is potentially a natural animal model for anorexia nervosa. Are there differences? Of course there are differences. It's two separate species. But might there be conserved mechanisms that are contributing to both phenomena? We think it's possible and a hypothesis that's worth pursuing. We learned also that there are other eating disorders that are seen in animals. Uh, and by the way, certain animal behaviors, which we consider disordered in humans, are commonplace. For example, food hoarding, an extremely common uh, phenomenon in wild animals. Uh, binge eating, very common. Uh, nocturnal eating. There are all of these behaviors that the DSM lists as pathological in humans or are actually common uh, and normal in animals. But we learned in, uh, from some zoo veterinarians that captive marine mammals and great apes sometimes will respond to social stress by self-inducing vomiting. It's called R&R regurgitation and reingestion. Now, I'm not saying that human you know, bulimia is identical to R&R, but it is interesting that these animals are using vomiting to soothe themselves. It is a self-soothing phenomenon. And when you talk to a human patient with bulimia nervosa about both arcs of the binge purge cycle, they will tell you that the binge is anxiety binding in one way, but that the purge is also self-soothing. So the question is, is there a conserved mechanism, a conserved self-soothing function that vomiting plays, something connected to a part of the autonomic nervous system called the, the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagal side, which is the rest and digest side. Again, we don't know, but a question that's worth asking. We asked the question, could an animal ever get addicted? And we learned that for about 100 years, naturalists have been describing wild animals ingesting naturally occurring psychoactive substances and exhibiting what looks like high behavior. The wallabies of Tasmania live um, in these areas where there are huge poppy fields. Tasmania is one of the world's largest producers of medical grade opium. And although the farmers put barbed wire fences around the, uh, these poppy fields, some of these wallabies will jump over these fences to access the poppy straw and the poppy sap. And they consume it and they get high. And sometimes they actually die of the intoxication or you know, they get killed. Uh, because they're, they're intoxicated. There are many examples that we learned about. We were only able to include some of them in the book, and fewer I'll be able to talk about tonight, but just a few that are interesting. In the Canadian Rockies, there are bighorn sheep that are very interested in consuming a hallucinogenic lichen that grows on top of these cliffs. And these uh, bighorn sheep will scale these cliffs to access this lichen. And some of them are so into it that they'll actually grind their teeth down to the gums trying to access more of the lichen. And then most iconically, um, the, the waxwing birds, uh, cedar waxwing birds, have this preferential interest in the fermented berries of pepper trees. And they, um, they will, they're said to fly over the non-fermented berries to access the fermented berries. And when they access them, they eat and eat and eat, and they become drunk. They are called drunken birds. We've heard veterinarians refer to wax-winged birds who are intoxicated uh, and flying as flying while intoxicated. So uh, yes, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of funny, but it's, it's funny the way like human drunkenness is funny. It's, not, it's a little funny, but it's not really funny because everybody sort of sees the consequences. And in fact, these wax wings suffer from the same consequences because when they're drunk, they fly into glass walls and they die. And this is seen in, in a number of, of uh, types of wax wings. This collection of, uh, of dead waxwing birds came to us courtesy of uh, the public health veterinarian in Los Angeles County, Emily Beeler. Um, and 
she did a necropsy on one of them and actually you can see that his gullet is just engorged with these fermented berries. So it's, again, an interesting parallel. Um, and the birds die of the same kinds of traumatic injuries that we see in human patients. Well, let me just kind of conclude by talking about the big idea. In medicine, we talk about the potential for translational research, which means taking knowledge that's being developed and discovered at the bench, that is, in the basic science laboratory, and bringing it to the human bedside. It has been transformational for human medicine. But Catherine and I think that there is another way to be translational. If translational research in its most traditional forms in form involves micro-inspection, then this ubiquitous species-spanning approach is the elastic recoil away from that. It's looking across species and even across time for shared mechanism and trying to understand and develop new ideas in this comparative way, which we can then also bring to the human bedside. I want to end with what we think so far is kind of our killer app, let's say. We want to demonstrate that there is a way to think in this translational way that can lead to new questions that you could not develop without this way of thinking. I know as a cardiologist that fear can sometimes trigger a heart attack and sometimes death. On January the 17th, 1994, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up, like everybody else in Los Angeles, by the last major earthquake to happen. It was a, it was a biggie. I think it was like 7.4. It was called the Northridge Earthquake. And um, about a year later, colleagues published in the New England Journal an article, and you can see the figure in the, le in the left upper, the January the 17th, 1994, the number of heart attack-related deaths compared to January 17th in 93, 92, and 91. A similar spike in heart attacks and cardiovascular death was seen after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and not just in New York and in Pennsylvania and in DC, but all over the country, anyone who was seeing these horrifying images on television. But it turns out that for human beings, it doesn't take a terrorist attack or a natural disaster to trigger this response. It could actually be even a sporting event. In, uh, in 1998, England and Argentina were facing each other in the semifinals of the World Cup of Soccer. And it was very tense. They had, uh, I, you probably, actually, you know, Margaret Thatcher just died yesterday, and they were talking about the Falkland Islands War. So remember how England and Argentina had had this war? So this was one of these, these games that was, was more than just a game. It was about national pride. And it came down to a sudden death penalty kick. The British kicker kicked the ball, and the Ar Argentinian goalkeeper jumped up and he grabbed the ball. And this is a picture of a pub in England, all around England. There was gasp, there was horror. They had lost. Argentina had won. And you can see the intense emotion, grief. There's the kicker. There's the coach. And a year later, the British Medical Journal published an article reporting a 25% increase in hospital admissions for cardiovascular cause in the 48 hours following the game, and a 30% increase in heart attack-related deaths in the 72 hours following the game's conclusion. Well, this is a very important point. Sudden death is one of the leading public health problems affecting our country and actually globally. In the US alone, 1,000 people a day die from sudden death. That's comparable to two 747s going down. And yet there are so many questions we don't have answers to. But we learned that animals from monkeys like tamarind to long-legged shorebirds, flamingos, hoofed animals, and many others also can have fear-induced sudden death syndromes. Can this comparative knowledge help answer some of these questions? Why does sudden cardiac death happen when it does? What are the environmental triggers that act to, to cause it? And why are some individuals more susceptible to this emotion-induced sudden cardiac death than others? We think that comparative knowledge may hold the key to answering these questions. We could one day develop a phylogeny for sudden death, and that could lead to the kind of translational knowledge that could help lead to even a cure. 
So I want to just tell you that um, a little tiny story. When I was a fourth year medical student, I had to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And medical students go through something called the match. You, you decide, you have to differentiate. And, but I, it was so hard for me. I liked surgery, and I liked internal medicine, I liked psychiatry, and I liked pedi pediatrics. And one of my residents, at that time I was doing a surgical residency, and, and one of my residents was one of these you know, typical kind of macho orthopedic surgeon types. And he said, what are you going to go into? And I said, well, you know, I like medicine, I like pediatrics. And he said, pediatrics? why would you go into veterinary medicine? Well, his intention was to put down pediatrics, of course. But it wasn't until Catherine and I started this project that I realized what he was doing, of course, was putting down veterinary medicine. And one of the challenges, honestly one of the problems, has been that human medicine has not recognized veterinarians as clinical peers. And that's part of what we're trying to do, is to expand how the human medical community understands the contribution of veterinarians. And I have to say that veterinarians have their own little joke um, at the expense of physicians, and I thought I would conclude by sharing that with you. We've heard from a number of veterinarians this little question. What do you call a veterinarian who can only treat one species? Of course, a physician. We would love to take some questions if you have any. We've been asked that you use the mic in the center of the room because it's being recorded for possible future broadcasts. Very, very good presentation. Uh, and I want to actually touch on your last point and ask a question out of you in that I'm a veterinary student, sorry. and. I think we, I'm also a food animal veterinary student, so I might have a lot of bias. So I think we're exposed to zoonotic disease and the comparative, um, I guess the comparison to, to human medicine and, and the things that, that we do and how they affect human health. And I think your, your ending is, is very, very uh, spot on. So I guess my question then is, how have your discussions, lectures, been embraced by the human medical profession? And maybe the second part to that be it would be, what, what do you recommend to helping the human medical field embrace zubiquity or the One Health uh, idea? Uh, right, well that's a great question. And uh, the real, I mean, I, I have to say that it's, it's the obvious answer. It's bi-directional. Both sides have to work to, to move closer together. Definitely veterinarians understand the One Health message in a way that most physicians don't. I do think that a key to bridging the gap is talking about problems that physicians are dealing with in their own practices. I mean, there are so many points of connection. And one of the challenges has been, frankly, that most of the time when you ask, if you ask a physician, what's the connection between animal and human health? I'll tell you what they'll tell you. They'll say, oh, I know that. There's the important role that animals play in laboratory investigation and zoonoses. And that's it, done. So to really generate a, a, a conversation that's enduring, I think we need to talk about what they're interested in and what they need, and we need to demonstrate that there's benefit, ultimately, that it's worth it. And I would say let's broaden the conversation beyond veterinarians and physicians to patients, parents, students, general public, um, we, Barbara and I worked really hard to make this book an accessible read. That's why our chapter titles are, we tried to make them funny, we tried to be engaging, we tried to tell s as many stories as we could. We're really hoping to, to broaden this conversation because ultimately it's about our shared health, the health of all of us sitting in this room, the health of all of the animals um, in the, you know, the, the skies and the fields and even our homes around us. Wow. I hope you get rich. <laughs> Seriously. I heard about this on NPR this morning. Bought the book on my Kindle at 3 o'clock this afternoon. 
and had it read to me all the way here to Ames. But this, and having taught high school agriculture for 15, 15 years and now working at the Department of Education, I've really seen this really as so connected forever. And I just thank you for bringing this up. But then when I think about, you know, as baby boomers retire, some analysts say that we're maybe not going to have enough physicians in the pipeline to meet the growing demand. How might something like this help with that? Well, that's an interesting question, how, how kind of the One Health approach can, can help extend the delivery of health care. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and I guess I think back to uh, a couple farmer examples. I personally know of several farmers that would just get a bad cut and stitch it themselves. Mm -hmm. And they knew enough about antibiotics, et cetera, to watch it. If they needed to go to the doctor, they would, but they could do the basics themselves. So I just wonder if there's an opportunity for maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's early days still. I think what we're really trying to do, I mean, even the pictures that um, I show of myself with the animals, you know, I'm not a veterinarian, I'm a physician. I show the pictures. My my own story was just I happened to be invited into this veterinary space. If they hadn't invited me, I never would have had the epiphany. But the field of veterinary medicine is discreet, as is the field of human medicine. There are licensing issues, and we're, we are still, and I think, you know, at the t for the time being, we need to be different fields. The problem is we are still very overlapping. I mean, I'm not legally qualified to practice dentistry, and yet I talk with dentists every day when my patients need dental work. And I think it's that kind of closer collaboration of the fields and um, really uh, one thing I think sharing sharing educational uh, space can be very helpful uh, back in you know in times gone by we know that veterinary and medical students train together in the first couple of years in certain institutions and even developing those early relationships can be very enduring because you know those people that you meet when you're in your 20s they're your friends forever and well, let me clarify my thoughts a little bit I mean, I had a brain injury five years ago. I sometimes ramble. But I guess I was thinking, you know, in terms of comparative analogy, anatomy, might there be a way that maybe more physicians will actually approach the general practice area than choosing specialties? Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool in, in health to choose a specialty rather than generalize? You know, that, that point is a, that is a great point. It, when you go, when I'm at the zoo and I see what the veterinarians are up to, they take care of, the, the zoo vets do surgery, they deliver uh, babies, they, um, they practice internal medicine, pediatrics and geriatrics. It is truly old, like old style kind of family medicine that, you know, very few people certainly at an academic medical center are going into these days for a variety of reasons. It's inspiring. And uh, that's a really interesting point, whether spending time with veterinarians might inspire medical students to pursue a broader, more primary case, uh, based, care based field. That's or, interesting. Or at least a more holistic, possibly group oriented. Yeah, and I guess I thought of it because, in general, I don't think veterinarians maybe specialize to the degree that physicians do? The, um, well, I mean, no, there's a tremendous veterinary subspecialization. But, but I think that, y y yeah, there's. But they're still educated in a broader range of species I, rather than just one, so. Right. I mean, we differentiate so early in human medicine. <laughs> Literally, the minute you graduate from medical school, you're either a, a medicine doctor or a surgical doctor. And if you go into internal medicine, you literally aren't going to be doing surgery. And, it, and then you bifurcate again. You say either you're pediatric or you're adult. And if you're adult, you never take care of any patient who's under the age of 18. So we do a lot of differentiating very early on. And I think that's actually disadvantageous. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, wonderful talk. Uh, I, I'm a veterinary PhD doing research on translational work involving lysosomal storage diseases in uh, dogs as th uh, develop to develop therapies for kids. So uh, this, is, this is wonderful talk to hear. It's sort of what I do all day uh, in my life. One area that you haven't touched on that you might think about is the delivery aspect of veterinary medicine. I remember when I was rotating uh, through oncology services, a vet student, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. It took him six weeks to get fully diagnosed and staged. Mm -hmm. We could do it in less than 48 hours in mm -hmm. a dog, and that involved biopsy, scintigraphy, absolutely everything you can imagine. And we did it for pennies on the dollar relative mm -hmm. to what my dad was charged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think it's sometimes good when you have a driver. I've been to a number of the One Health on the human and avian influenza, uh, where you had a real topic which caught the news, and this then drove the One Health together. Uh, the other one, I suppose, is West Nile, although the uh, humans were a little disparaging about West Nile when it started. That, that takes up the topic of our final chapter. Is oh, that, yeah. The story of the vet heroine who I was had instrumental lunch with, uh, in discovering. I had lunch with Ms. McNamara, and it was very yeah. interesting. And part of that story happens here. And uh, Just one comment. Um, England have lost five penalty shootouts. I'm surprised there's anybody left there. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a pre-vet student, and but I'm also really interested in psychology. And it was really cool how you found like the similarities between the basic diseases, but with more serious diseases like schizophrenia or multiple personality, did you find any correlation? Well, that's a good question, and um, you know, I would just to be um, just to be a little bit of a professor, a little bit of a teacher, I would take exception to the word serious because the issues of anxiety disorders and OCD, they're very serious disorders as yeah. well. And um, we found many, many overlapping syndromes. Whether these are identical or not is hard to say. Let's take the, uh, if, to talk about, let's talk about um, Alzheimer's disease. So yeah. Alzheimer's is um, very debilitating, uh, of course. It, the, statistically, it's increasing in its incidence. There is a disorder called canine cognitive dysfunction. And as we're learning about it right now, there are some fascinating parallels that um, I think are potentially very generative from a research perspective. The, um, the question of schizophrenia is a little bit harder to get at. There are potential animal, naturally occurring animal models for autism. And schizophrenia continues to be elusive. Uh, but I suspect there will be, as we identify more of the, uh, the, the biological underpinnings of schizophrenia between both the genetic factors, the epigenetic factors, I suspect there will be animal correlates in some capacity. I think it's going to be very difficult to find truly unique forms of psychopathology. But remember, until very recently, there wasn't, we weren't even willing to consider the possibility that animals had emotions. So this is really new days. And uh, we know of several books that are about to come out about, about uh, comparative psychopathology. So you should stay tuned for those. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I'm curious as to how much research was done with like the the food animals, the cattle and the hogs, in regards to the like the mental disorders, and how that would impact the way one person or the general population would view, you know, eating meat or animal products, and because obviously that industry is like huge here, so I I'm kind of interested to know your opinions on what that impact might be. I mean, we we're just starting to learn about the psychopathology. One of the most interesting things we learned about is it's going to it's going to create a laugh but it's a real disorder so polycystic ovarian syndrome in, in dairy cows can cause a, what's called nymphomania so a hypersexual behavior among cows and that is uh, well if you could, might consider it a mental illness or, or not but it does have implications for women who have PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome is a very important human medical problem we used to think it only happened in women who were you know obese and very hairy but it turns out there is a high incidence of PCOS in normal weight women and it's a cause of probably a cause of idiopathic infertility so knowing that these dairy animals who have PCOS exhibit this behavior can explain some of the psychiatric issues issues that are seen in PCOS um, human patients. You know, other than that, we have not been looking explicitly at, at farm animals and psychopathology. We've learned about, you know, the consumption of loco weed and those kinds of things. But, but if that's going to happen anywhere, here's a good place for that to happen. And then actually, I have a second unrelated question, and this is in a class I've been learning about. The mitochond mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother and the... Uh, the way it's transcribed and translated, it doesn't have the same types of uh, double checking system. Uh, so there's higher incidence of error. With animals that have a smaller generation time, you know, maybe rabbits or hamsters, mm -hmm. did you uh, find any increase in uh, the prevalence of these types of diseases in those? Or is that something that maybe that wasn't covered as much? or? Maybe I'm completely wrong. No, it's a great question. We actually looked at something that's um, kind of on the other end of that. We, there's a, 
It was a British geneticist, epidemiologist actually, a guy named uh, Richard Pito. He was knighted, so he's Sir Richard Pito. And he um, observed that larger animals, really big animals like elephants and whales, that if cancer Cancer occurs, of course, when there are problems with transcription, and it's connected to cell division. So on a very simple basis, an animal who had more cell divisions over the course of its life should have more cancer. And based on his work, every single whale should have, he looked at the colon cancer, every single whale should have colon cancer by the time it's 50. And as far as we know, that isn't true. And so it's called Pito's Paradox. And there's some interesting work that's now being done asking the question, how is it that very, very large animals don't have more cancer? Uh, and we actually are, we know a couple of uh, people who are collaborating, some human and veterinary oncologists who are collaborating have come up with some very intriguing early findings about why that may be. So that's on the other, on the other end of things. Thank you. all the questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hold it just a second. <laughs> Before we uh, we we enjoy the reception and the book signing. I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Lisa Nolan. She's the Stefan G. Julesgaard Dean of Veterinary Medicine, and she'd like to make a special presentation to the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. I, I thought that was a great talk. They are such great ambassadors of uh, the one medicine concept but also the veterinary profession. And as a veterinarian, I really appreciate that. But it's uh, my pleasure to uh, commend you on your dedication to promoting the commonality between human and animal medicine, as illustrated in the great book, Zubiquity, uh, and in the wonderful presentation tonight. To show our appreciation, I'm honored to present each of you with a replica of our beloved gentle doctor statue. The original sculpture was created by uh, Christian Peterson in 1938. You'll see it tomorrow. The original now resides in our Hickson Lead Small Animal Hospital. Uh, it's become an iconic symbol uh, that's used worldwide to illustrate the great wor work performed by everyone in the veterinary profession. I think uh, the late Dr. Frank Ramsey, uh, an alum and former faculty member, said it best. He described the sculpture uh, this way. He said, the gentle doctor reflects concern, affection, love, and the significance of life for all creatures, great and small. I'd also like to thank everyone involved in making this event so special, including Dr. Roger Marr and his family, uh, Dr. Marr is the CEO of the One Health Commission. So um, let me get the statues. Uh, I'm going to disappear for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, join us for the book sign in the back of the room and get a chance to meet our speakers one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>